We're born into this idea. Go make money, go chase the American dream. These things that we're told and our parents were told and their parents were told and we're gonna tell our kids, right? Chase this thing. Well, the idea is more for me, more for me, more for me. That is American capitalism. The problem here, we've been brought to it through a strange moment in time where the airplane doesn't really function, where the restaurant doesn't really exist to serve you food. Hotel is just barely has the bed for you to rest your head on at weary head at the end of the night. That's enough to drive you freaking crazy. I'm running a company. I got to make that profit. Got to grow. Got to grow. I got to cut costs. I got to grow. I got to cut costs. I got to grow. You know, and you're doing that mm. for one year, five year, 10 year, 20 year, 30 year, 40 year, 50 You know, at some point you're cutting into bone, but I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Ray Flemings, welcome back to Chicago, baby. Thank you for having me back, Nicholas. This episode is brought to you by the champagne cork that almost hit you in the eye last night. <laughs> Sabering. Sorry about that. No. I did right. I aimed I aimed the person who I was teaching how to open the bottle with a sword directly at your head. And uh you heard a whiz and uh But I made it out alive. No contact, baby. And here I am. No contact. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Hey, my pleasure, man. Thanks for coming. So uh, the last time I saw you was what, about a year ago? A little about more? a year ago. Okay. Um, 10 or 11 months. Okay. 10, 11 months. I was in LA. We had met for the first time, had no clue what the show was going to be about. Hands down, the most viral episode of the Really Rich Podcast. Woohoo. Okay. And I know, I know that when we walked in there, we were like... Oh, I don't even know what this Neither is. Neither of us knew the other. Yeah, right? we're like, I don't know like, how this is going to go. Yeah, yeah. But uh, number one, so we touched on your company, Miria, and then we we do, dove deeper into the topic of wealth and luxury happiness and happiness and, yeah. and all those good things. And I and I think we'll do that today and push it even a little bit further because now we've we've had some audience feedback and we've got data and we've got all this kind of stuff and the conversation has really opened up since we last met. Sure. Uh, because I think this is something that, well, not a lot of people have access to this level of depth and insight that you do. And you're kind enough to share with all of us. If someone didn't catch the last episode, sure. we touched a little bit on Miria sure. and what you guys do, but I just want to make sure everyone's no, thank got you. a fresh. Thank you. No, it's a great prompt. Sorry. Just, yeah. just, uh, yeah, we dive right into here. things. Here. Absolutely. So yeah. Miria is a community and concierge for the ultra wealthy, um, people who are incredibly successful. Um, there's kind of been two big needs. Number one, um, these individuals spend like enterprises, uh, literally millions of dollars a year on lifestyle and recreation. If a business was spending millions of dollars a year, they would have a team around right. them managing procurements. Right. Um, but most people uh, who are in this position do not want, um, a team of people managing the spending in their personal lives. Mm -hmm. Many of them are lucky to have one assistant. Well, that doesn't mean that it's still not hard. That doesn't mean it's not complicated. So there's this administrative procurement layer uh, that Miria um, solves for people in that position. I'll give you an example. So imagine uh, uh, you've had some success. You're building your family office. You decide you want to purchase a plane. Well, now your assistant has to become an expert in aviation. Right. And all the contracts and select a vendor and NDA them and figure out what's the best FBO and, may, you know, kind of all of these questions around it. Mm -hmm. And then you decide you want a boat or you decide you want new vacation property or you decide or you decide or you decide. Every one of those things requires the assistant to go be a new right. expert in those areas. And there's friction at, and there's unique friction at each turn. In Absolutely. these decisions, different vocabulary, different industry players, so forth and so on. And so Miria, um, you know, we solve the problem uh, so that those people don't have to go and become experts in everything. We're there to help them. And so the price of a Miria membership is like a, essentially like a fractional headcount that supercharges uh, their family office team. And we create a community enabling these very successful people to meet other people like them. You know, some of the the kind of unknown things around success. Success makes people insular, right? The more successful you become, billionaires become a dirty word. People feel like they're always, you know, kind of being hit upon for things being taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. And so the more successful you become, the more isolated you become. 
And but successful people also want to meet other successful people. Sure. And you so you see uh, peer networking organizations like uh, YPO and Tiger 21 and R360. And they do a phenomenal job of networking business people, right? Kind yeah. of business side networking. Um, but what about but the, social? What about what the about fun? Social? What exactly. about cutting there's, loose? Exactly. There's been yeah. no, um, there's been no organization really, really focused on just the personal lives of people outside of a business context. And that's what the Myria community has, uh, has built. What I want to hear about is, is what, what's going on with Myria because you guys had a, had a full year of action and I want to know what's, what's the update there. Well, big updates. Uh, okay. the first, the life of an early, any early stage startup is yes. always, uh, a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the last year, if it's been anything, it's been colorful. Mm -hmm. uh, all the ups and downs, all the drama of reaching product market fit, uh, the business crossed, um, you know, it's significant ARR milestone. We, um, closed out 2023, uh, also with s significant sales, millions of dollars worth of sales. And we started the year, um, our first 60 days, we essentially did, you know, 40% of what we did last year in 60 Fan days. Fantastic. Um, we um, have begun B2B partnerships, uh, companies that want to thank their best customers in the world. So if, um, you know, someone purchases a $50 million plane from you, do you send them a nice super Tuscan? <laughs> As a thank you. <laughs> Here's a bottle of Warren Elias. Th right. Thanks or, for or a plastic plane, yeah. right? Thanks someone for the wire. A, a big home. You're uh, an investment advisor and a client, a family office, family, what have you, gives you uh, $200 million to manage. Mm -hmm. You're going to charge them a hundred basis points a year. As long as you're managing the money, mm -hmm. do you send them Lakers tickets, you know, as a thank you. And so we've had companies who are coming to us, uh, really to drive customer loyalty, to thank their customers in a bigger way. And so they're purchasing Myriam memberships. They're also making spending money, uh, large amounts of spending money available to those clients. So um, that's a really, <clears throat> excuse me, that's a really interesting area of business for us now uh, is on the B2B front. Our And w how does it, we, we, the last time we met, right, we talked about this kind of like an, an onboarding that almost looks like a psychological analysis in a sense, like giving you a menu or even developing your own menu of saying, Hey, it's great. You're successful. What do you want to do now? Now that you have the opportunity, how does that look like I sign up or I don't know. Sure. Sure. Uh, yeah, walk apply. me through the process. Yeah, so, yeah. so a person completes an application uh, to join the application really takes them three to four minutes of their time. Uh, typically people are coming in either as a result of you know, a podcast or media like this or through a referral or now through our B2B channel. Okay. Um, we have a lot of systems in place that perform a number of checks. And what we're looking for are people that we can delight who are very successful um, that you'd enjoy going to have a meal with, mm. right? That's the social test. You know, is yeah. this a person that you, that you'd enjoy getting to know if we can't delight that person, if we can't perform a little magic in their life, uh, it doesn't matter that they're very rich, right? Yeah. And, uh, if you had someone who was less rich than another person, but a really nice human with a great direction for their life, trying to do interesting things that we had kind of a, a natural ability to support that makes a better customer than a person who has a higher net worth. That's interesting. It's this, it's the classic rich versus really rich skin, <laughs> right? Indeed. It, it ultimately what you're saying is you're, you're selecting, you're basically turning down folks, not because of financial means, but because of, Hey, you're, you're just not going to have fun here. You're not the right customer. There has to be some of that, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, what we do is hard. There is this concept, money cannot buy everything. And that's a hard concept for very rich or newly rich people to kind of wrap their brains around, mm. right? That it's not, you know, everything in the world is not monetary. There is an access component and access um, comes to you, right? You gain access to this sort of world of private events and private experiences and all these things you read about and hear about, and many of which you don't even hear about, but you gain access to them, uh, through relationships and reputation. And just because you made money doesn't mean you have global relationships with everyone you need to know. Right. And just because you have global relationships doesn't mean that you have the reputation sufficient 
to get access to anything that you want. Right. It, it's funny because we think of we think of money as this extremely all powerful thing, but all it's doing is you're interfacing with other gatekeepers and people. It's not the key to the city. It's the key to maybe the person who gets to decide if you can, it's just going to open the door or not for you, right? Right. I mean, at really high level experiences, they're all, you know, expensive, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there's a monetary component, but it's not really about the money. When a, when an owner of a, <clears throat> a very significant vacation home, mm-hmm. so let's say a guy owns a hundred million dollar house. Um, they're not going to rent that home on Airbnb. <laughs> Okay. It'll never be rented. It's on probably Airbnb. for Craig, Craigslist would be a better, I think, channel for that. <laughs> right? um, it's a vacation home. They don't spend a lot of time there. Oh. They may be willing to rent the home, but the first question is who? Yes, they're going right. to charge you a lot of money to rent it, right. but it's not about the money. They, they have the money to own and operate a $100 million home without ever taking a rental or a tenant in it. Sure. Um, but they rent it out to people that they want to rent the home and to. Tr- and trust. And yeah, there's some, absolutely. there's some rapport there. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. I mean, what's, what's the famous story where, um, Oh God, it was, um, I think it was an athlete rented his house to Prince and he, he said, Oh, you know, I forgot my keys. I'm just going to run back. He was in town. I got to run back. And Prince had installed the artist symbol in the front of the driveway. That's funny. The entire uh, driveway was purple, carpeted, and then the inside of the house, all of the furniture had been removed, and Prince Vibe, you know, Animal Prince and purple. That's funny. Completely decked out. That's and the guy funny. was like, hey, Prince, wh- what, you know, what the f- are you doing in my house, man? And uh, yeah, the supposedly Prince said, hey, don't worry about it. It's gonna be better. Like when I give this house back to you, it'll be better. It'll be better than than when you left it. And supposedly the guy came back at the end. He's just like, oh god, what? I'm this nightmare sucks. tenant. Right. Nightmare, but Prince. He's a nightmare in my house. Right? Comes back. Whatever. Six months later, Prince finishes the tour. The house is returned completely back to stock settings, spotless. And Prince just tipped the guy three hundred grand and just said, sorry about the the scare. Prince was a character. That's for sure. That's for sure. I like that story. Yeah. So, I like okay. Story. And that's a long winded way of saying, uh, when you've got a hundred million dollar house, you're not going to rent it to strangers. Don't it's rent it all to about strangers. The, it's all about the reputation of the person. Although you'd probably rent it to Prince if you had the chance. Yeah, I would too. Yeah. I would take that chance any day. Even if you came back with a purple driveway, you'd be like, yeah, I'd be like, that's, yeah, that's pretty sweet. Yeah. I'm, I'm good with that. Yeah. So, so when you're, when you're going through this onboarding process, at some point you get, a welcome notification. Yeah, sorry. So they apply. There is a, a live interview uh, with their membership team. Um, referral considerations. Uh, there is a bank level KYC, anti money laundering, politically exposed person mm. checks. Mm. Uh, there's a net worth verification, and then really and truly, like, what do you want to do? Like, what services do you need? Who would you like to meet? Where do you want to go mm-hmm. with your success over the next year? Those are the questions of can we delight you? Right? Are the things that you want to do things that we can actually help you with? Okay. Um, we don't like to bring on a customer that we can't actually provide services to, right? Because at the end of the day, um, if you don't need or you know let's say you're super busy during this cycle or you're having a baby uh during this cycle you know those sorts of things you know don't lend itself for us you know to really get um a good use out of the service on the one hand a lot of people you know we've actually had people argue with us and just say i don't care about the services i want the software the tools the community yeah we might be having a baby but it's worth it for me to spend, you know, a fifty thousand dollar membership for my wife and I, because you make our administrative team better, you give them superpowers, right? And so we've actually had people who, you know, are like, you know, maybe I'm not going to be traveling a lot this year, but just so that when I do want something, I can reach out and my team can reach out to solve all of these various mm. problems, uh, and it's worth it for them. Because even fixing that one thing or smoothing over that one thing at that dollar amount, it's to them, they say, okay, it was worth it. Yeah, I mean, like you can't hire a, you know, an EA in America, a, no. for $50,000 a year, no, no, really, no. Right. right? Not not at the level that they want them to operate. Right. And so this, you know, this $50,000 annual fee, which provides, and we're not an admin service, right? If, you're, if your general administrative assistant can do it, they should do it if you're a Myriad customer. But we do add really special capabilities 
knowledge, know-how, databases, wisdom of the crowds, all of these things we're adding to their lives. The, the, the thing here, right, in, in something I scratched my head at, it was, it was you're an alum of Y Combinator, and nothing, we haven't touched on anything tech-related yet, but what's underneath all of this is tech that's power, this, that's facilitating yes, all of the moving absolutely. pieces. No, Myria, Myria is a two-sided marketplace. If we were getting into investor gobbledygook, okay. right? So why um, not? There's, yeah. Myria is a, is a two app ecosystem. So okay. there's an app for our ultra high net worth members. That's where the community is. That's how they speak to our concierge and customer service teams. Mm -hmm. um, that's how they meet each other. Bring the mic a little bit. Yeah. Sorry. That's how they meet yeah. each other. And, um, you know, so that's the demand side of the application. This is where our ultra high net worth members sit. The supply side is where our global brand partners, luxury hotel groups, sports teams, uh, okay. other concierges, all of the folks that control access to special things sit on this other app. Okay. Myria has a white glove customer service team that sits in the middle. And it is that team that essentially, you know, makes everything, makes the experience of our customers and the experience of our, of our sellers, uh, hopefully delightful mm. in the middle. Mm. And there's, so, so there's this, there's this two-sided marketplace that's invisible to the outside world that's been created and, and this must open up things that could never have happened before. I mean, it like... The things that you can't Google is our tagline. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the we obviously had dinner last night. the th The things the things that you that don't get posted to Instagram. The the things that you go, oh, that party looked fun. It's like, yeah, that actually the real party is over here, <laughs> and you're not invited. To, <laughs> you're not invited to it. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, a lot of people, as I said earlier, they're private. Mm -hmm. And so many of the best experiences, they're never marketed publicly because they're not publicly available. You know, one of the really interesting things I found is that, you know, even organizations that have, uh, say, season ticket holders for sports teams, there are experiences that the sports teams have available that they don't make available to their own season ticket holders. Okay. So this is like, this is the next level shit that, Yeah. We can't go on StubHub and get that. There's always a, a, a door. There's always an experience. There's always another, you know, kind of level to it. And unlocking that for people, giving them access beyond hospitality and tickets and boxes uh, where they're actually enjoying uh, meeting their heroes or kind of touching the experience in a, in a meaningful way. That's really at the heart of what we do. Where are you? What is the event that happens when someone says, I, I'm going to pick up the phone. I'm going to go on the website. I got to meet, I got to meet these guys. I've got to apply. What, ha what, where are they when that happens? Um, what happens right before your phone rings or your, your inbox gets some, an application? In it? Some for sure have had a recent wealth event or liquidities coming, right? So the, you know, you get a lot of people who go heads down. They're building a business. They're working on a transaction. What are, you know, doing, 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 doing. Right. And most people, many people in that position are like, well, I don't need lifestyle services right now because I'm in build mode. And as soon as the sale is on the horizon or recently completed, um, you know, a lot of people will find us because they begin thinking about, well, how do I operationalize this? Uh, we also get calls from folks that are setting up family offices often, right? Okay. So, you know, they've kind of moved from, you know, the multifamily office or the broker sort of scenario into, hey, I'm setting up my own single family office now. And the multifamily office had a service layer, you know, folks that could help them with that. And how do we actually provide non-financial services in a robust way? Because again, the best assistant in the universe, this poor person is being asked to become a global expert in everything on the fly. And all sorts of crazy shit right. that you and could it, think of. And it's just not possible, right? right? So I've been in this business for many, many years. We have software and tools and networks and employees. And even we don't know everything. Even we don't know everyone. Uh, we've seen most of all of it at this point, but for a, a new assistant working for an ultra high net worth individual, they're just running around 
And it's a very, very high stress job on those folks. So we found that this sort of like uh, model where, where Miria serves as an adjunct to them has been really, really exciting and beneficial for folks. Why do you think that amongst a certain set of um, males in the Northeast, what, why? <laughs> okay, you're going to get me in trouble. You want me to make some why generality we, in your stereotype? Why, come on. We need these, in the Northeast. We need right, these views, on. baby. <laughs> I'll do anything to get them. <laughs> right. What is the obsession with the black card? Like, do, do, we, do we think that the American Express black card is going to provide this key that we've always, and, and then when we get into the, the guy with the black card at the table, when he puts it down, you know he's the boss, right? Mm -hmm. we, how, has, how has that happened and affected us? Well, the black card effect. Yeah, of course. No, no. I mean, listen, the black card was advertised or kind of entered the public consciousness as this um, indicator of status. And we'll talk a lot about status today. Um, and it meant something at the time that it was first introduced, right? It meant that, you know, you were a, an American Express customer of a certain level, but part B, it meant that you had access to special things by virtue of it. Um, the problem with the Centurion program today is that um, the person who answers the phone mm -hmm. is the same person who answers the phone for all American Express cardholders. Right. And so American Express has uh, the last number that I saw was 130 million credit cards in force. And so if your concierge is taking the phone calls of 130 million people, is the thing they are doing special? If they're doing it for 130 million people, obviously the answer is no, it can't be special because you're doing it for too many people. And so this is why so many Amex cardholders they have it for the status symbol, but they're frustrated with it. WealthX did a study and um, found that 75% of ultra high net worth individuals are dissatisfied with their concierge, even when they are their own concierge, even when their own family office provides their own services mm. to them. 75% are dissatisfied. Bain did a related study and found that um, basically three fourths are willing to pay more for a better concierge. It's almost like, well, this uh, is all. Sorry, let me let me sharpen that. Uh -huh. Bain found that uh, three fourths of ultra high net worth individuals are willing to pay more for a concierge that works. That was the phrase, a concierge that works. Isn't it funny that that I think the mindset is, well, this is the best that. This is what it is. This is the best money can buy. I got the freaking black card. We only know what we know. I got and the black. I must be, you I'm know, there. this sucks. I've arrived. But, but th this is, this has been my deep, oh, oh, I'm hyper aware of this thing. We talked about it at dinner last night where all the high end things that you worked so hard to get first class, the MX lounge, you know, getting the bottle service. It all is monstrously disappointing and low quality. Like the thing that's supposed to be the best now sucks. Like the best isn't that good. And when you get there, you go, there's gotta be something more, b better than this. Yes. So f flying first class, flying first class, in my opinion, gives you the ability to board the plane sooner and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what else what else is happening so this whole topic yeah right of uh you know i put it under the banner of of late stage capitalism right of uh, which is a euphemism really for corporate capitalism uh, the idea that the interests of the economic system no longer primarily serve the needs of people. The economic system primarily serves the needs of companies, right? People so the, meaning even customers. Right. So <laughs> the people so, buying the services. So, yeah. Yeah. So the, 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 the big idea of American capitalism, right? The overarching thing is to us what water is to the fish. We're born into this idea. 
go make money, go chase the American dream, go, you know, these things that we're told and our parents were told and their parents were told and we're going to tell our kids, right? These, these ideas are just out there. We don't even really know where they came from, right? We just, we just grew up hearing them and they're in our ears. So we go and chase this thing. Well, the idea is more for me, more for me, more for me. That is American capitalism. And so when every person is thinking more for me and every business is thinking more for me <laughs> and every competitor is thinking more for me and every supplier is thinking more for me and every retailer is thinking more for me, you have this system whereby um, f first class is worse than coach class was when commercial aviation began. OK, so, you know, when if you look back at the history of commercial aviation, um, there was no such thing as first class until roughly 1953 or 54 when Howard Robart Hughes invented it. I didn't know that he had purchased an airline called TWA and uh, he had many, many innovations at TWA, right? He was really he had the idea. He had already made, of course, a, a fortune inheriting uh, the oil bit. And he had gone into films and he had done kind of all of this stuff, but he's like, he had a vision for commercial aviation and, uh, you know, did all sorts of things, expanded routes, expanded the planes. He, you know, he ordered, you know, true kind of coast to coast airliners. He, he had, you know, black people on the cruise. He was an innovator, but people don't credit him for the primary in innovation, which was inventing first class, which was bringing in status hierarchy to 30,000 feet to, to, to aviation. And so the cabins before this was introduced, um, all of the seats were first class because flying was such a luxury right, rarity, right? Right. Right. The now, whole thing was just great. Of course. Uh -huh. And the law of unintended consequence, of course, Howard Hughes was trying to democratize air travel in his mind. Right. So this wasn't, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. He wasn't trying to make it, he wasn't trying to be mean to the masses. He was trying right. to make air travel more affordable for right. millions and millions of people. And you're not a conspiracy theorist because we had dinner and I would have picked up on that. And you're definitely not a conspiracy theorist. I believe this. You know, my thoughts on all the crazy stuff going on in the world. But aliens is, are real. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he, he invents first class with the best of intentions. To say, hey, we have to provide a lower cost solution. So that more people in the fly. air. Yeah. And so the way we're going to make more money per cabin is we're going to make the planes bigger and we're going to charge a lot more for some seats. And then we'll have cheaper seats that allow more people to fly. Genius. Them, right. And this is continued. This is continued. This is continued. Uh -huh. And it's rolled into a system where today airlines understand something. And that is by making customers uncomfortable, by making it suck for you, you're willing to pay more yeah. than you would have if it didn't suck. To bring yourself not not at a higher level, but to bring yourself back to baseline, mm -hmm. like like sitting coach seats don't f recline like at all. Like so, you're you're like right. You're, you're like that is in some place. I think that could be considered torture. Sit here, don't move for five hours. Mm -hmm. You, the, the damage that that must do to your, I mean, well, the seat's I'm 18, not a doctor here, the seat's uh, right? 18 inches wide. You're not 18. You're wider than 18 no. inches uh, from left to right. I'm built like a brick shit house, right? Yeah. Right? So <laughs> like, you know, yeah. Seat is 18 inches wide. It's at a pitch that was, was probably putting more pressure on your spine than a freaking vice grip and don't move. Oh yeah. And there's two psychos sitting next to you and a screaming baby behind you. This is, I'm, I feel like we're describing a torture chamber. And this is actually why air rage, uh, air rage. Yes. Yeah. These sorts of incidents and you see them on YouTube where yeah. a passenger has a meltdown and punches a flight attendant or the crew has to duct tape him. To I the mean, I'm, I'm just, at that level at some point on some of these flights, <laughs> right? You know, uh, before COVID there were about 400 air rage incidents per year in America. Um, starting in 2020, there've been five to 6,000 <laughs> per year. And bring on the rage. And there have been less flights. Uh -huh. Right. So, so it's more concentrated. So, right. So way less flights yeah. and like, you know, a 
50, yeah. whatever that is, 15 X increase in air rage. It's like incident. the, it's like the grappa of, uh, air rage now. Right? It's so, the real pure shit. Exactly. So, yeah. so the FAA is like, how did this happen? What's the cause of this? And so, um, they worked with a, a group of researchers out of Harvard, actually as, out of Harvard, as usual, out of Harvard. And, um, and they asked, um, look at the flight data, every flight in America for, for the last five years and help us figure out what the cause is. Is it delays? Is it, you know, the, the occupancy or overcrowded planes? Is it, is it food? Is it, you know, look at all the correlating information and see if you can figure out, you know, kind of what the cause of all this air rage is. And <laughs> what they found was surprising. They found <laughs> that it was the first class cabin itself having one on a plane, uh, which was the primary cause of air rage in America, that when a plane has two cabins and the passengers board from the front door, the first door, right, and main class passengers have to walk through first class. Yeah, the walk of shame. Right? The walk of shame. Mm -hmm. That those people are... Um, two to three hundred percent more likely <laughs> to rage on that flight, <laughs> to punch a flight attendant, to go crazy, right? <laughs> but that's not even the surprising part. The surprising part was the other way around. That when passengers board through the middle door and first class passengers don't get to prance down their aisle, uh huh, uh huh that it's first class passengers who are nearly 1,200% more likely to air rage. <laughs> so what, what the hell is happening here? Is this this, I've been hyper aware of my status and now in that way, I'm going to behave in a very outrageous, this is non-human way. Yeah, this is uh, the positional concern, which I've spoken about uh, online before. So in 1999, uh, Solnick and Hemingway, uh, two researchers, uh, released a landmark study. And um, they asked uh, you know, hundreds of research subjects this, this question. The question was, uh, you're looking for work and you get two job offers. Job offer A is going to pay you $100,000 per year mm -hmm. at a company where your coworkers will make 200,000 on average. Job yep. offer B will pay you $50,000 a year at a company where the average coworker makes $25,000 a year. The answer I think for most should be obvious. Yeah. But the researchers found that fully 50% of Americans choose job B. Now this study drives people crazy when they hear about it. They're like, oh, 50%, that's not a statistically valid sample. This has been proven and reproven and studied and restudied. It is a American and Western economic phenomena. It is of course rooted in a America's very, very ugly history and past, right? This sort of like, I got to be better than this group of people who's irrelevant, so forth and so on. And it's one of the fundamental drivers of discontent and problems in the country. And one of the reasons that we can't solve some of these big uh, sociopolitical issues. Is it, it, is it creating two groups, an in-group and an out-group? I'm first class, your coach. It's, 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 it's the Yankees Mets it's, or it's, is it, it's, I'm I, aware it is, of I, where I am in is, the hierarchy. It is. I want to, I want to feel better than someone. Okay. Well, walking through first class is a sure, and you're sitting in coach is a surefire way to make you feel like shit. Mm -hmm. There is no possible way that you walk through that with a smile. Mm -hmm. It is, it is the best. Cause this is the smile on the face of a first class customer is the <laughs> sickest. It's one of the sickest looks if you really d dial close into it, because it's, I hate that I am here, but I have to be here and I feel a little bad about it, but I'd never be back there. It's, there's a guilt 
in the smile. There's a sick sense of voyeuristic pornographic. I get to watch you walk through and go into your hell hole in the back of the plane. Like there's this, it's a very complex emotion. And as someone who spent a good chunk of his life in both classes on an airplane, sure. when I, I, I feel the, the sadness walking through first class and going to coach. And then I feel the pathetic elation of being in first and going, oh, I'm just so much more comfortable than you. And I've been sitting here for a full five more minutes than you have, but I don't want to show it too much. Right. Because then I'll look like well, an so, asshole. So this is the whole point, right? So everyone is getting on the same plane and going to the same place at the same time. Period. Right. I mean, fundamentally, you're on the same aircraft. Yes. And um, look, flying in coach is not all bad because the lower price seats are subsidized, in fact, from a cost perspective by the more expensive seats. Yes. So that's kind of the, the business rationale. But uh, due to airline consolidation, uh, the airlines don't really have competition. So that lower price ain't so low anymore. Right, so the prices continue to, to move up. Yep. They continue to remove planes and flights from their fleet, pushing capacity Pressure. higher, higher, higher. And now even that first class passenger that you were describing. So I flew out here yesterday uh, and I was in business or whatever on uh, United. United, <laughs> um, <laughs> the lady comes, comes into the cabin to feed everyone. It's like four hours from LA, you yeah. know, and she's like, Oh, the goody, for this, meals. the spoils of war, right. my meal on this right. plane. <laughs> um, so there's, I think, five rows in this cabin, and I'm in row three. And so the lady, you know, I'm not paying close attention, but she asked people, you know, kind of what they want to eat. But she's like bouncing around, like back and forth and back. And it was, it was kind of weird because normally they'll just come and say to the first two seats, what do you like? Yeah. The next two seats, and just right. kind of work it It's down. actually, I talked to the person in the window, and then I talked to the person in the aisle. Right. Next row. And she's going like yeah. one, four, two, five. She's four, doing a crisscross method. Right. Yeah. And, and I kind of ask, I'm like, everything okay? You, like, what's, what's do going I on suck? With the yeah, what's going on? And yeah. she told me, she was like, um, I take your food orders based on your, um, your airline status, <laughs> based on how many miles that you have. And I'm like, what? Um, That's savage. And so the, savage. the airlines continue to create everything that they can do because it's actually how they make money. Yeah. Right. So, um, so there's status, profit, there's a status hierarchy inside of the top status they, hierarchy. They make profit via inconvenience. Ooh. And it creates this scenario where everything has to be annoying for everyone. Now imagine, of course, you want to talk about rage. Now imagine that you don't have the dollars to pay your way out of it. And you have to suffer the crap end of it that's created to make other people. And this is actually the problem. These are kind of the fraying of the system where, where, well, airlines exist to serve passengers, right? No, airlines now exist to make profit. And the profit before passengers, before the experience of the humans, right? It's kind of like, well, we have homes in America so that Americans can buy them. But now 25% of all the homes in the country are owned by corporations and many Americans can't afford them. Well, do you know what happens to our economic system if... People can't afford houses, yeah. right? And we so were losing just, the plot a little right, bit here, exactly. right? We, we have lost the plot. And this is, you asked me last night to define late stage capitalism. That is what it is, right? When it, this sort of corporate capitalism where the needs of humans, the citizens, the people yeah. um, are lost trying to support a system in, uh, in an overly concentrated and overly silly way. And here's the funniest thing about my business. The public narrative is that the rich don't care about this, but that's not actually what I see. Um, our wealthiest clients are some of the most vocal in trying to change this stuff and sounding the alarm on inequality and sounding the alarm on these things. They don't always get credit for it. Okay. It's not always talked about, but you, you see some of it come out where, you know, say Warren Buffett, um, very publicly was like, Hey, why is my tax rate lower than my secretary's? Mm -hmm. Why is this person who, you know, goes out and works in this way and 
you know, there was some earns of, money with their hands versus an it, investment it, it, vehicle. It, sure. Exactly. Why are they right. taxed less? Right. And um, so you're seeing some very rich people who understand that, you know, there's some problems that we need to fix in the system. And I'm an optimist, mind you, this is, there's no doom and gloom. Ray. Sure. Um, I think we're going to, to get through these things, but it's going to be require intentional work and it's going to be painful for us to get there. And you might have to sit in some tiny shitty first with that seat still recline until we get there. Um. <laughs> well, it, but this isn't you know it's like I, I could picture some guy in an, in a in a easy chair just going these guys are complaining about airlines the whole podcast. It's like no 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 this is everything. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. This is going to a restaurant. This is staying in a hotel. This is engaging in commerce in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> the quality of the experience is going down almost almost to the point where you go. Is the customer the enemy? Well, it's, so you see this with Boeing right now. Doors flying off the planes, landing gear falling off the plane. Well, so you would say that Boeing exists to make airplanes to fly people safely, but it doesn't. They've got their publicly traded company. So they've got to, you know, they've got to increase their earnings every year. So their primary purpose is profit. And well, how do you keep making profit when your business is already fully at scale? some point you start cutting corners right and and it is this this sort of like profit 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 thing and it's not boeing they're not bad guys and it's not united they're not bad it is the game we're all playing it is the system that we're all playing the, 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 this the more for me thing I, yeah i because i'm not a hundred percent on the, the more for me th okay. the, the thing is this works and it, it has worked but um, like, it's almost like we're hitting a stage where so many of the problems have been solved, and when you when you hit this point, that's when the optimization curve starts to go upside down. Like like, if if you're, you say okay, well, we fly people from here to here. Now what do we do? It's like well we we solved the problem of you know now what do we do? Well, I guess we're going to have to use psychological torture to get people to buy peanuts and upgrade their seats and pay for an earlier board and pay to just be able to put your freaking bag on the goddamn plane. And then, oh, wait, it's actually four ounces over. That's a hundred bucks. Like the, so we we got what we wanted. And then when we got it, they go, well, it keeps going. You didn't want what you got. It yeah. just keeps going. Right. Go to go out to dinner in Miami. Okay. And you just say, am I even, am I even eating dinner right now? <laughs> am I even at a restaurant or am I at a strip club with, with, with like, oh, well <laughs> that guy over there, his steak comes out with five waiters who brand it with a cattle prod. Okay. And it's a thousand dollars. And because you didn't get that, your date's going to think you're a loser, right? It's we, this thing, <laughs> are we there to eat? Ray, or are we there to be treated in a, in a, in a manipulative way to spend more money? Cause well, we sell steak. That's what we do, but, but we got to make some more money. But it does sound like you're making the more for me argument. It God does sound like, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm such a believer that I'm value guy, right? Mm -hmm. The reason the more for me means you're going to go out there and create some value. If you're not, th th if you're not stealing, the more for me, start a tech company like you've done. Okay. Go out, become a great athlete. Okay. Go become an actor, go do some write a great hit record, right. value, 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 and get rewarded for it. But what's happening here is there's a continuation where this, the value that you've created starts to splinter at the end of the cycle where it's like, you did it, but we're still here. What do we do now? We're going to keep pushing it until it's no longer valuable. Technically, when you get on a flight, you get from point A to point B. And you're tortured and you're in pain and you've got someone threw a soda bottle at your head and the flight attendant deserved you last because you didn't have airline miles compared to the next guy and you were humiliated and the bathroom exploded and you've got to change clothes and uh, the pilot looked at you like you were a dick. Like, what? I uh, did I actually get from point A to point B safely? 
Just because the door didn't blow off on the plane? I've been tortured, manipulated. I couldn't sleep. I'm hungry. I, uh, what the hell is going on, Ray? Well, I mean, listen. This I'm is getting one, fired up about this, This is Ray. one of the reasons that we are in the business of experience, right? So we are, on the one hand, trying to ease all of these sort of artificially created pain points for people. Where you just say, you know what? We're not going to play that game. We're going to go around that. We're, we're fixing it. So I'm in the business of solving those problems. But even as I'm solving those problems for our wealthy clients, I think it's important to have the systemic conversations around, hey, how do we make this better for everyone, right? Um, Instead of just saying, because I have this thought myself, when, I, when I'm, you know, uh, where, where did I fly the other day? I went, I went up to, uh, um, I went up to where I went to college for, for a weekend, right? And I just said, there could be no greater motivator to get a private jet than this trip. Like there could be no greater, but what that's doing is that's not solving the problem. Mm -hmm. That's me going, whoop, going around it. It's just, a, oh, well, I'll just go around it. There's a crash here. I'm just going to go veer around it and hope those people are okay. Right? right? And what you're saying is, you know the people at the end of the thing, and they're saying, yeah, I can go and pay to go around it, but I'm actually interested in doing some work and checking out and making sure people are okay. Yeah, you know, it's, that's just kind of goes back to the, the, the luxury, post-luxury, post-post-luxury conversation, right? Where, you know, we talked in the previous episode about, you know, when a person finally makes enough money to buy a nice car, they'll run out and buy a Ferrari or two, you know, to look like, hey, look, I've made it. When a person is incredibly wealthy and has the net worth to buy Ferrari, the corporation, they may not even own a car and might Uber everywhere and, and don't really care about it. And that's in the post-luxury box. And I, was con I said earlier, although I didn't explain well in the previous episode, that there are people who've even moved beyond that. And these are people who've made a fortune, they've spent a fortune, They've moved away from luxury and are now like Warren Buffett in his taxation comments. They are trying to actually affect greater good in the society and make systemic level changes uh, to our system before um, all of the problems uh, kind of run us over. You have to remember that um, things like the Great Depression or the Great Recession in 2008. Um, these are not financial events primarily explained by economics and money. These are psychological events. These are large populations of the, the percentages of the population getting afraid, scared, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the markets were in, you know, terrible shape preceding the events that, sure. that, that triggered them. Um, but as long as everyone was exuberant and kind of playing along with the game, yeah. stocks go up, right. Yeah. It continues to, to kind of work when everyone freezes, seizes, Wait gets scared, et cetera, et cetera, panic. And then it kind of moves the other direction. Right. And so like, you know, people are saying now they're like, Oh, I'm trying to take liquid positions, you know, Oh, the, the market's overheated, the market's overblown and so forth and so on. You know, but at the end of the day, the federal deficit's been $30 trillion for as long as I can remember, right? All of these sorts of fundamentals have been where they are and heading where they are. And so if we, if we scare the shit out of each other at all times and like doom and gloom it, and we can't talk and every presidential election is everyone's pointing fingers and everything's a fight and everyone's mad at each other, then it hides the point that you're making. The point that you're making is violent crimes actually on decline and breakthrough and healthcare is coming and AI is here. And there's all these, there's all these bright spots happening mm -hmm. in society, mm -hmm. but you can't tell if you turn on your TV or open mm -hmm. social media, cause everybody's fighting and discontent and pointing fingers and war. And you know, all of this kind of stuff is going on at the same time. And so where, you know, where we're out having fun and helping people enjoy their lives, um, and we won't stop that. You know, I make no apology for what we, we do there. I think it's important, uh, but we're also having, you know, these sorts of conversations as well. I think, uh, cause I'm trying to get an answer for myself here a little bit. Right. I'm like trying to work through this. It's when you see on the news, 
of people attacking each other, whether it's at a political rally yeah. or on an airplane, the reaction is, look at these idiots. But really, those idiots are you. They're us, exactly. Look at us. Look at us. Mm -hmm. Look what we've been brought to, okay? And the problem here that we're pointing at is that we've been brought to it in an artificial way through a strange moment in time where the airplane doesn't really function as a customer tool to satisfy you, where the restaurant doesn't really exist to serve you food, where the hotel is just barely has the bed for you to rest your head on at weary head at the end of the night. That's enough to drive you freaking crazy. So this is the, the whole living wage issue, right? That it, again, an economic systems, the purpose like we're humans. The purpose of this is not economic theory. The purpose is improving the lives of people. If that's not the purpose of an economic system, we need a new economic system, right? right, right. And like it's not like, charts and graphs. It's, right. it's you know, it's are people mining coal? Their, yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. Are we building a better world? Yeah. Are, are, are we feeding people? Are we safe? Are we happy? Right. Um, right. If that's not the point of this thing, then we have, as you said earlier, lost the plot. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. So I'm standing on my balcony on the beach, kind of overlooking um, the, the little walkway there in Santa Monica. And a woman is walking her cat. I don't see many people walk their cat, right? And she was walking kind of slow. Uh, it is and so LA, I said though, something but... to her, right? And, uh, <laughs> you know, because I've had a Savannah cat before and you can put them on leashes. And so we struck up, you know, a conversation. And um, she's like, oh, you know, nice house. What do you do? I tell her the Miria story. And I respond normally like, oh, what do you do? And she says, well, um, I'm a driver for Amazon. I deliver packages here to these houses. Mm -hmm. I was like, cool. And she's like, and I live right over there. And she points toward the ocean. Well, my house is the closest possible house to the ocean. And I'm like, where? She's like, on that bench right there. Yeah. So this woman has a full-time job working for one of the largest corporations in the world. the founder of which is one of, if not the richest people in the world. And she is living on a bench. If the economic system leads people to work full time and have to live on benches, this woman wasn't high. She wasn't a derelict. She was articulate. She was nice. She was taking care of her pet, you know, but she is literally living on a bench, working a full-time job. Why keep working? Right. And when the system creates those outcomes for so many people, this is why you see all the discontent throughout the middle of America, throughout the heartland, if you will, uh, the, the, the middle class in poly speak, right? That, that, that folks are like, the system's not working for us, right? That, Three people, um, Bezos and Elon and Bill Gates, have more money than the poorest 50% of America. 165 million Americans, less money than three. Now, you're not going to tell me that three people worked harder than 165 million people. You're not going to tell me that three people worked smarter than 165 million people. And you can say whatever you want about political theory. I don't care whether you're a capitalist or a socialist. That is not good. And that's not going to end well. And that is not a function of merits, right? That is a function of a system that's creating outcomes that doesn't benefit the people that it's designed to serve. There's, when we move into a world of limitless resources, data, bits and bytes, processing power, right? Like we move away from steel, iron, cobalt, you know, uh, oil. We move into a world of information and ideas. What's happening is I think that we're returning to an earlier state of living in a sense, because you can kind of be this 
independent techno forager with the tools and skills to run a billion dollar business from a beach with a Starlink and a, and a Mac and, and you, you can sort it out. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then you have the folks that you see in the background of pictures from the great depression that look like they don't even have a pair of shoes on their feet. And you're like, well, what happened to them? What, what happened to those people? The people that didn't figure out that railroads were going to be, you know, where it's at. Right. I, I feel like there's a divergence and because of the lack of physical, the, the infinite nature of, of working with tech, there will be the folks that get it right and have been getting it right. Like the folks that you mentioned. And then there's the people that don't, for whatever reason, pick it up, get it right, get in the game, whatever. And then there's this disconnection and the, we return to a gilded age with rich, extremely rich and a lot of poor people, or we return to a feudal system of Kings and literally v- uh, villagers. I, I would argue that there's another, there's another opportunity, you know, that there is, um, all of those things that you describe were born out of a scarcity mindset that humans had to have kind of coming yeah. back throughout. Get all off of my land. Don't drink my water. Don't mine, eat my corn. Mine, whatever. Mine, mine, yeah. This is the sort of scarcity that, that if I give it to you, I have less of it, right? That, that this mine thing. Uh, I actually, you know, I shared a story with you last night, a, a section from my upcoming book called the, the cost of stupidity. And it goes something like this. Um, people who look like me, born with brown or black skin in America, um, die about seven years sooner than people who look like you in America. The reason that we die sooner, of course, is all of America's ugly past and present that creates all of these social stressors, dietary, da, 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 and creates this literally seven year early death for people who look like me because there is no biological basis between us. The genome has been sequenced. There is no such thing as race. We already know that. This is clearly all created by society. Well, there's about 42 million black people in America. You multiply 42 million times 365 days times seven years, and you get a really big number, right? It's like over 2 trillion man hours. When I did that math, I was like, wow. What could you do with two trillion man hours? And so I looked up like some of humanity's greatest accomplishments. I looked up the moonshot, mm-hmm. the Apollo space program. And how many, how many man hours did it take right. to get to put a man on the moon? Heck of a project. Right. And, yeah. and keep in mind, putting a man on the moon, you know, helps satellite communications to this day, which enable us to, you know, right. There's knock on around the benefits, world. not right. just, so, yeah, okay, we're at the moon. Okay, I went to the moon, right. It was right. all the improvements. Sell off the shit society. and move on. Yeah. That was about 5 billion man hours. Okay. And then Oppenheimer was out, you know, it was like the Manhattan project building the atomic bomb. How many man hours was that? Mm-hmm. The Manhattan project was about 1 billion man hours. And so we are wasting just basically being dumb asses two to 300 moonshots in lost productivity. Do you know how much more productive, wealthy, happy, safer, how much more money, how much more everything this nation, you know, even the seething racists life would be better with 200 more moonshots being made in America sure. than, uh, than it would be without it. Right? right. And it's just, so I don't actually think that we need to, um, just look at the world that it may be returning to this sort of feudal like concept. I actually think there is an opportunity for there to be a uh, hyper abundance, uh, a meta concept where through cooperation, like we're, we're making it hard by fighting over it. Uh, as opposed to being like, what if we made bigger pies instead of fighting over a single slice of pie? I'm total, I'm totally there with you, but what, what I, I'm completely there with you. And I have a whole 
my my whole what I'm teasing apart in my in my book is about we, we are moving to this non zero sum game environment, but we we're still human, so we still think don't get off my lawn, my, yeah, yeah of don't drink my water, and right. you know, yeah. whatever. But, but but the the worrisome thing here is these the the these things that these tangential things where we start to see the corporation dis disserve customers or the monoliths disserve because the truth is startups serve customers startups serve customers we must if we don't we go out of business we go really out of quick. business pretty freaking fast quick. we don't so have big balance sheets it's really yet. you and i don't go to business every in into the office every day and say how can we eke more how can we irritate people so they give us more money you wouldn't you'd have to start over yeah that wouldn't be a, a way to win we would never make it so startups enter the market and what they do is disruption in a sense maybe is i'm actually returning the value uh prop to this thing right where right. it was like i'm i'm so innovative because i've just deserved to decided to serve customers again and treat people with respect yeah. and open opportunities to people who for some reason have been ground out of the market or for or chased out or they've run screaming you know go stay go stay in a corporate airbnb guys and tell me how fun that is right yeah right with plastic silverware and uh, a chair that you sit down and you f you fall through the wall right into the next corporate airbnb like some L lsd trip uh <laughs> <You're funny. laughs> so so I'm I'm inventive. I'm 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 a trailblazer. I'm just bringing value back to the market. I have a hyper specific example because my startup basically serves people who are salespeople who send a lot of emails. And there's a lot of big fancy email co software company and CRMs and all. And nobody likes the tool. They're forced to use it like toddlers. Like you're in timeout. You better update your Salesforce notes or I'll kill you or you're fired. Right. So. What we see in the market in our little neck of the woods is everyone is forced to use a software that doesn't pr produce any results for them. They hate, mm. right? And they're paying a fortune for it. So mm. we say, hmm, what's happening here? Do you think if we made a tool that people like to use and actually help them and gave them less homework, we maybe have a, a business and we'd all get rich and... You know, and sign up, it. sign up right. to Myri as Join quickly as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it makes me feel good that I'm one of the good guys in this, in this whole crazy story. Right. Of course, I've got to make sure I'm on the right side of this, but it, it, it seems as though there is some other weird factor that happens in the monolithic corporation in this, th where we start <laughs> to get disconnected. We start to lose the plot because it's hard for me to think like Boeing, right? I think like Nick Crown and I think like fast outreach or revise or whatever it is. But I go to work and I try to help people. But, but I, I actually believe that everyone does, right? So this is why I, I described it as the zeitgeist. Uh -huh. This is why I said that this idea is like water to the fish, right? I think that the Boeing executives go to work in their mind trying to do the right thing also. But what is the right thing that we're taught to do? I'm running a company. I got to make that profit. You know, I've got to grow it X percent a quarter. Every mm -hmm. time earnings come, got to grow, got to grow. I got to cut costs. I got to grow. I got to cut costs. I got to grow. You know, and you're doing that mm -hmm. for one year, five year, 10 year, 20 year, 30 year, 40 year, 50 year. You know, at some point you're cutting into bone, but I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm a, I'm a CEO. I'm supposed to cut costs. I'm supposed to prioritize the share. I'm supposed, and you know, I'm not saying that these people are trying to do the wrong thing or be the bad. Nobody ever thinks they're the bad guy, right? Nobody ever thinks of themselves as like a James Bond supervillain. And that's why I'm calling it systemic. That's why I'm saying we've got to change how we think about it. And America sets the tone. This summer, I, um, I rented a house in Hollywood land and uh, Hollywood land was a real estate development underneath the Hollywood land sign. Okay. The land eventually was removed and now the sign just says 
Hollywood. Um, but it's really a beacon living in that neighborhood every single day, seven days a week, hundreds of people walked up Beachwood Canyon to go and look at the Hollywood sign because it was a symbol and what it represented. Mm -hmm. So America's economic system was exported through Hollywood to the world. That's why and how capitalism defeated communism. Mm -hmm. That's how and why, you know, all of these things, you know, people come to this country to come and chase the American dream. And I'm simply contending that the American dream needs to be updated. So the American dream, that phrase was first coined in 1931. Um, you'll note that that the proximity of that timing was in the great depression. Okay. And, um, we simply need to update the definition, right? Cause it was out of scarcity, the depression, the more for me concept that I'm talking with you about. And, you know, there needs to be more cooperation in the form of capitalism that we are yeah. practicing. Mm -hmm. We've gotten so selfish with it. And I laughed with you about this last night, American capitalism today, um, would call <laughs> Adam Smith a socialist. Yeah. Adam Smith is the founder of modern capitalism. He wrote Wealth of Nations right. the same year that this country was formed. Literally, Adam Smith, uh, based on today's definitions, would be a socialist. I think, I, I think what we're seeing is that it's not infinitely scalable. It doesn't infinitely optimize. I, I'm, you know, I'm really trying to figure this out, Ray, mm -hmm. before we go today. Sure. Okay, I like to walk away from from these things with some kind Nail. of way to go for yeah. it's it's what what happens is innovation and, and and these these the fruits of the capitalist system aren't necessarily infinitely scalable yeah. the airline can't get bigger indefinitely there is some natural law that starts to go and now we are at the point where you destroy the product right mm -hmm. or and now we are the hotels chain that doesn't you can't even go to bed and rest at night. Right. We're now the restaurant group where I'm not, I'm not even eating um, animal. Uh, pro that's not, a, that's a bad example. I'm not eating healthy products anymore. I'm eating trash. I'm eating filler and it's not, make believe food. No, it's not food. Right. Right. So, so yes, you are a eating. restaurant in the business of no longer selling food. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 you know, food in America a lot of it it's we can eat it but it's not food right i remember when i grew up there was a man who ate a television set he was a he was a fan no, seriously you could look it up he ate he ate a cessna he would, he would just eat he would eat objects you can eat anything that doesn't mean it's food right yeah it's not nourishing i mean body. i did pledge a fraternity once <laughs> you can eat most anything right um but yeah when you look at like I mean, we're getting far afield here, but yeah, it's, it's not healthy for people. And well, why wouldn't a food manufacturer make food healthy for the people that are eating it? Because they're running a business and they're trying to maximize profit before the people. And this is the, this is the whole theme of this. And, um, look, the source of good judgment is what? The source of good judgment is bad judgment. We've gone through all of these experiments. We've done all of this stuff. Now it's time for us to take the learnings and simply improve upon it. We don't have to be trapped by system or dogma or economic position. We can build a better country. Mm -hmm. We can talk more. We can have conversations like this where people disagree and don't get into fights. Mm -hmm. We can, um, we have so much to be proud of, which is your point. We're solving so many problems. We're in this age where you know, cancer may be conquered and disease and just all of these great things, but we can't figure out how to get along. <laughs> right. And, and I think it's just that old appeal to, um, you know, the human conceit, the me, 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 me. And the moment that people realize that you can feed the selfish urge or reflex and have more for yourself by also enabling others to have more for themselves. 
<laughs> that you build a way bigger pie for everyone yeah. as opposed to this is my d- d- d-. that worldview that perspective makes it smaller for everyone makes it tighter and harder for everyone and the delight comes the magic of my business is when we've got a successful client who's ready to enjoy their lives Mm -hmm. they want to have some fun they want to spend some money and you know what they connect or we connect them with top service people the world over miria is creating a i think a service revolution ai is coming it's already here well, I mean, uh, sorry, artificial general intelligence okay. is coming, right? That's what it thinks for itself, <laughs> right? It, it's coming. Yeah. But it's not going to stop the need for humans to provide services to other people. No. We're going to have to work with each other. We're going to have to help each other. But service jobs in America have been gutted. They can't make a living wage. You're waiting tables, you're providing services, you're picking up trash. These people are struggling to just make it in this country, right? And so how do service people, you know, everybody's not going to get a STEM degree. Everybody's not graduating from sure, HBS. Everybody's sure. not going to do these things. So how do normal, good folks, hardworking people who want to take care of their families, but they're not going to Stanford or Harvard, what do those people do? They're in the service trade. We believe that Miria is creating kind of a, a luxury service profession market mm. and channel where mm. these people can provide great service to people who are very wealthy on the other side and build a great career and have a great life. This goes back to the whole issue of the middle class, right? In the old day, in the old days, if you graduated from high school and you're a good person, there were jobs where you could yep. own a house and vacation and send your kids to school live a normal life bills and, and live a normal live the american dream right at that time i can picture it in my head just right? the picket fence the house the yeah. dog you know you know exactly. the retriever running back and forth in the yard and so yeah. what i hope we're doing um building this business that is helping incredibly wealthy people enjoy their lives and fulfill their dreams is also helping the working class and the service providers fulfill theirs in kind of marrying the two together in the marketplace of Miria and creating these special experiences is special for both sides Mm. because the service folks that work for us, that that deliver services to our clients, they take delight in doing awesome things for awesome people. Sure. And that's why we interview the customers. That's why it's not just about how much money you You make. don't just throw them to the wolves. Right, it's like, oh, well, you're rich, so you can go be a jerk to these hardworking people who are out here busting their ass for you, right? Yeah, like, no. We, we want good people whose heads and hearts are in the right place, who wanna enjoy their lives, who are willing to pay for it, and then pairing them with amazing people and creating special experiences for everyone. That is the magic of Miria. And do you think by You've got the, okay, in, in your arena, everyone's got the money, but not everyone's got the disposition. Mm-hmm. Just by changing your attitude from negative, selfish, cranky, all for me, I don't care about you at all. You're just in my way. Changing, flipping that attitude mm-hmm. to giving, humble, you know, maybe even a little friendly. Just enjoy What, what happens... When you do that. Yeah. I mean, it it opens up so many possibilities. I have met clients over the years. We have a phrase internally. This is a client who is getting in their own way. Um, You know, I've had a few relationships where people are so hyper-focused on a very small amount of money that they ruin their own experience by being too like micro focused on a tiny thing on a uh, line item on a on, exactly, something. Exactly. Exactly. I had a client, um, you know, they wanted to go on a vacation and they had never been there. And so we're like, we'll put this amazing vacation t- together for you to this, this place. And, um, the client chose the villa, that we recommend it, but then plan the rest of his own vacation to this place because he had a buddy there, boom, 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 boom. He rented a quarter of a million dollar villa for the week. 
um, but then essentially messed up his own experience trying to save the planning fees around it. And at the end, he was like, well, that place wasn't really that fun. But in his mind, he was saving money. He still spent half a million dollars on the experience. <laughs> right. Right? It wouldn't have cost him any more to do the deal with us. Right. Right. It like literally it may have even cost him less money. But the, the perception of, you know, kind of how the fees move. And there are literally people, you know, I had a guy. I think this goes deeper than the money, though. To me, this is I don't value your opinion and your professional judgment. That's what that says to me, as opposed to. I want to save the money. I had a guy spend a um, million dollars on a vacation and there was a line item from a driver. Um, the driver charged, I don't know what it was, 1200 bucks a day. Um, and the client was using this driver 25 hours a day. Right. Yeah. And the guy lost his shit client it was like it should be no more than nine hundred dollars so you're talking about seven days or maybe not even five days times three and about fifteen hundred dollars on a million dollar vacation it's a heck of a five-day banger and the client lost his shit over fifteen hundred dollars why and do you think what what is happening in that moment yeah so people who are very wealthy are often taken advantage of and they're often um, hit upon and the stress of it and you know again getting in his own way the rate was more than fair for the work that was done and you know, that was just an example of a person who's not a good client. So they're no longer, you know, sometimes in these businesses, we have had to let go of about one client a year, right? It was just so unreasonable and so ridiculous. Like it's a, like the guy literally never slept for a week driving you around the island safely. Tip the dude $300. Who cares? It's some, it's some island worker. Like, like, first of all, it wasn't even his rate was market. His rate was fine. And the client was kind of being a jerk. Don't get in your own way, guys. Don't get in your own way, for sure. Don't get in your enjoy own your way. Life. Enjoy your life and enjoy your million dollar vacation and your $250,000 villa and shut the fuck up <laughs> and pay the driver, okay? <laughs> That's all I'm saying. It's, it's, it's good for everybody, right? This, right? this idea of the whole topic that we've been talking about. Well, the money goes like, to the driver. It doesn't go to, you know, some, you know, uh, NVIDIA chip you know, uh, research program. Right, 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 right. It goes to so the guy, you know. We are going to need each other. What is the point? You've made a billion dollars and you need armed security with a machine gun to walk you yeah. to dinner. Yeah. What is the point? You've got a $70 million plane. If the system falls apart, is anybody going to go to air traffic control to fly you out or gas your plane no. up? No, like we've got to look out for one another, right? Or so you'll or you'll be in a a way scarier world, okay? That you won't want to be in. I, my, this thought we experiment. We have these guys. Yeah, we have yeah. these guys. They're like, oh, I'm getting citizenship to I'm wherever right. New Zealand or wherever. Like, how are you going to get to New Zealand when it all goes bad? Right. Because it doesn't it doesn't go bad like glacial. It's like bop ignition mm -hmm. right it's like boom and when there's a crisis nobody's coming to fly you to right. new zealand right and away sir their family for you right like, there's like, a nuclear meltdown but hang on yeah, let like me get a, the jet ready and roll out the okay, hermes yeah, blankets the way. Like, <laughs> let me put the cookies out in every, the uh, <laughs> exactly everybody's going to be concerned about themselves and their, and their family, family. nowhere to go and so right. since there is nowhere to go why don't we make our stand here mm -hmm. why don't we make our lives and our nation and our economy better instead of escaping as the ship goes yes, down right it's just like oh well i'm gonna i'm gonna get I'm gonna my dip. escape plan 
And, uh, you know, who even wants to live in this sort That's of hunger interesting. game That's you know, interesting. Sort of universe? That's interesting. Be- because I've toyed with, oh, man, who hasn't toyed with the idea of another passport or some secret little backdoor passport, you know, whatever. Um, you're like, Nick, I haven't done that, but it's good that you... No, but I've, I've thought about this. And what's interesting is, yeah, it is, it's foolish to think you're going to make this like... You need someone to help and usher you through this getaway of whatever who won't be lifting a freaking finger for anyone but their f- friends and family in the moment of whatever yeah, impact. Im- imagine this imaginary getaway place with just rich people. <laughs> yeah. Are they going to start serving each other? Does anyone know how to farm? Does it like you what, what happens? I mean? Right. Exactly. What happens yeah. in this scenario? So you get there it's to great your thought bunker, experiment. Like there's yes. Right. There's, there is no, you know, there's I mean? no function to this, this place. Exactly. You need normal humans. They're going to have to come in there and help you and support you and serve you right in New Zealand or anywhere else. And so if you need people, if we need each other, if, yeah, then why don't we take care of the people around us right here, right now? Right. Since we're not going to like go somewhere else and change this fundamental human fact. What's funny about this thought experiment of everyone being rich, right? Is you would ultimately have to return to a lower state of life in maybe a foraging or a hunter type of way to survive in that scenario. So you're like, good, I'm rich. Now I'm wearing a loinskin cloth and th- throwing a harpoon through a, a, bo- a bison. Have you seen the movie field. Triangle of Sadness? <laughs> no. All right. So I told Brewster's Millions last time, I'll tell Triangle of Sadness. This will be my movie quote this time. So Triangle of Sadness, um, you know, it's one of these, uh, it, it's a more recent film. And it tracks the life of, uh, of a young, attractive couple, like a model, I think a male and female model as they go on a a trip and they're on a small private yacht with a bunch of very rich people, uh, having a, you know, having a time vacation. The captain of the ship, um, has decided that it is his last day sailing his last voyage. And he is going to, um, give an F you to all of his wealthy clients. Okay. Uh, as a side note, actually, had an experience like this in real life. I'll tell you that if you want to hear it in momentarily, but back to the movie. Um, so the, the captain like sails into a storm and he starts reading the communist manifesto <laughs> over the thing. Not good. And, um, not the way you want to, you know, and be going down. The ship winds up getting a grenade thrown on it by a pirate and, um, sinks the next morning, all of the rich guests, and the surviving crew are on a beach at this nearby island. Well, on the boat, um, this woman cleaned toilets. But on this island, she was the only person who knew how to fish. Mm. She was the only person who knew how to gather food. Status hierarchy just got flipped. (laughs) And so it's kind of funny seeing this guy's like, um, he's pulling off his this is like, you know, it's a nice watch, right? He's like, I'll give you this watch. Useless. If you'll, if you'll make me some useless. Some bitch, right? Right? Yeah. And it's like, if you go get like, me a, a little of that spicy tuna roll that you're making over there. I'll give you my, uh, my Rolex. Right. Yeah. And there's this great line. She's like, who's the boss? And she's got like a little morsel of food for every rich person. She's like, come. And she's like, who's the boss? And That's like, fantastic. The boss. And she's like, on the boat, I clean toilets on this beach. I'm the boss. Anyway, it's a funny movie. Uh, just kind of a, a, as a thought but of it's, experiment. It's, it's, it's quite real. I, I mean, like, I don't see how this would play out in any other way if this were to happen, this scenario were to unfortunately happen to Yeah. So I had a, a, a miniature Ibiza version of this one year. Um, this goes back to like Air Rage. Uh, we chartered a, a yacht in Ibiza for a birthday party. And unbeknownst to me, I had chosen the one boat in the Mediterranean where the captain had made that same decision from in the movie. Oh my, the captain had decided that this was his final voyage and he was going down. He he was going to, it was air rage. He had been putting up with drunk ass party people in disrespectful. He had been, and he had fucking had it. 
and t- today was his day to shine, right? Like, right. like being the lottery. Yeah. Okay. Now I had no idea that this was the case. So, I didn't even know that this was a thing that happened, but neither did I. Yeah. I, right. Like I, this is going postal, and, but on a yacht. So, yeah. <laughs> so the first thing that's weird is that I get to the boat early. You can feel something's off. Well, I don't even know. Right. So it's, it's like I get there early and they won't send the tender to pick me up. And we always inspect our boats if we're running on trips. So I'm sitting there, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. It's hot as hell. It's a bees, it's 100 degrees. And they make me wait on the shore like an hour mm. to pick me up. Now the guests aren't there. I'm getting heated, whatever, whatever. But we get on. Trip starts. He won't go to the locations we ask him to. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> All of a sudden, the passenger says, there's no toilet paper. I'm like, what do you mean there's no toilet paper? He's like, yeah, there's no toilet paper in any bathroom on this giant yacht. How can there be no toilet paper? And the crew's like, we ran out of toilet paper. So we stop in Formentera. I'm like, fine, I'll take care of it. I know this restaurant really well. We go have this great lunch. Okay. The restaurant gives us 24 rolls of toilet paper. Great. Okay. okay. And we have our lunch. We get back on the tenders, go to the boat. I give them all the freaking toilet paper. And I'm finally relaxing. An hour goes past. And someone's like, there's no more toilet paper. <laughs> and that when they said it the second time, I got it. You knew what was happening. All the weird, because there's only one person on the boat who has the authority to take all the toilet paper out of all the fucking bathrooms. And it's just this like passive aggressive, just like super duper crazy thing. And like, we didn't make it to our locations. Like everything was wrong the whole day. Mm-hmm. And it was like, this guy is intentionally sabotaging the trip. And when I confronted him, he basically, he wasn't even talking to me. We, we were actually great guests. He wasn't mad at us. We we're respectful of service mm-hmm. people, but he was mad at, I don't know, 20 years, 20 of years of bu- captain, bullshit. Right. And he fucking went off and uh, just kind of a funny story <laughs> to end your career that way. What a shame. Yeah. I asked my, uh, and my charter guy, he said, no, he never worked again. That was his last day. That was it. That was his final day. He was like, fuck this. And that's thanks to all of the years and years of assholes. Can you blame the guy? Can you blame the crazy captain? Would the crazy captain have not done that if everyone was just nice and cheery and sure. said please and thank you and sure. the basics didn't puke the on stuff the stuff you f- learned in kindergarten? <laughs> be polite. <laughs> well, you know the greater message is just you know what I mean, like like treating people the way you want to be treated, no matter how much money you have. And he clearly had felt for a very long time that he wasn't treated in that way. And he, he had had it. He reached his boiling point. It was just like literally just a lottery moment, right? Just the universe, jackpot. right? Just like, <laughs> boom, I hit the jackpot, right? Like I, I draw this one captain out of all the boats that's ready to end it. <laughs> okay. This is, this is something I always wanted to ask you because when, when there's this windfall moment, right? Maybe you're the second or third call. What, is there a regret? Is there a moment where people get rich and they go, ah, I mean, it's for some. So I had, I did have a client tell me that the day the money was ledgered to his bank account triggered the deepest, darkest depression of his life because he didn't have another thing to chase and he'd been chasing his whole life and then he had it and he was like, but I don't think for most people there's regret about being wealthy. I think there's maybe fear of, okay, what effect is this going to have on me? My kids, what do I do with it? How do I manage? So there's like anxiety, right? More so than regret is that would be my characterization of it. What's what, when you have a windfall, when you have a take home hundreds of millions of dollars, what's the most, what's the first thing that you have to do when this moment happens? What do you do? Yeah. So we, we believe that we're actually building an organization to be that first call or one of the first calls that, you know, in the absence of Miria, that typically goes first call to either an attorney or a finance person, right? When the, when the wealth event is happening. And so, uh, typically that's the sale of some business asset. Typically there are some banks or what have you attached to that sale and they're having conversations with the entrepreneur sometimes for different reasons. Like it's a family transfer, you know, uh, 
the recipient uh, will want to start fresh. They'll like, oh, okay, yeah, you know, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be represented by the same people who are on the, the counterparty side, mm-hmm. right? And so uh, we're getting more and more of those calls, which are like, hey, I have a wealth event coming up. Can you help us? What do I think about? How do I think about this? What are best practices? Who should I call on? Uh, we have hired some very incredible people to run family offices for our clients and to help them make those decisions. And, you know, for my career now, you know, Miria will reach 150 to 200 members this year. Um, and most all of them have a family office and that experience of seeing how, um, scores of single family offices work is, uh, is invaluable insight when people are trying to do it for themselves. Mm. You literally interface with hundreds of high ultra high net worth individuals, right? What, what do these people do? How did they get there? What are the, what, what's the most common path to hundreds of millions of dollars? Sure. Sure. So, um, the most upwardly mobile city in the world, um, in the past 20 years has been San Francisco, California, um, because of the tech boom. And so many of our clients are founders of technology businesses. It is kind of the modern day gold rush, right? The, the Y Combinator companies like ours, et cetera, you can have an idea, you can work hard and you can build relatively quickly, you know, a large company and the fortune that goes with it. You know, that's kind of one of those areas. Um, real estate remains, um, a really, really big uh, source of ultra high net worth clients for us as well. Uh, probably outside of tech, maybe the the second largest kind of most mm. active, you know, folks who are getting involved in various uh, transactions there. Um, intellectual property. And essentially, let's just say intellectual property is one bucket and then like private equity style transactions is another where, so you've got a small business that is profitable um, and buying up other businesses, buying revenue, so forth and so on. Those are, those are probably the four primary strategies that I see people, um, you know, kind of entering the high net worth, the ultra high net worth ranks. Um, and then kind of the last and, and, and most obvious is through inheritance. Hmm. So okay. you are in the middle of the greatest wealth transfer in history. Uh, millennials will receive $90 trillion in the coming decades. And, that, um, you know, that wealth transfer is actually doubling the number of ultra high net worth individuals. There's about 400,000 today. It'll be 800,000 in five years. Wow. That's the oldest way to get rich, right? (laughs) Just already be rich. Be born rich (laughs) and you're rich. What are the lessons that you've learned from dealing with lots and lots and lots of successful people? You know, um, one, that they're not the the villains that you you think of the caricatures of the rich aloof asshole. I have to tell you, the super majority of the people I have come in contact with in this journey have been delightful human beings who care, who are trying. No one person created any of the systemic problems we're talking about. None of them, right? And they, like anybody else, even with a billion dollars you still can't solve all the world's problems or change the hearts and minds of men in mass scale just because you have made a fortune. And so folks are doing what they can. Lessons that I've learned also include, you know, we have some principles in our business, right? We're always managing expectations. And this is a good note for folks' careers. You know, you, the minute you're not, we say internally, the moment you're not managing expectations, you're losing a customer, Mm. right? Um, Tell the truth, bad news first. You're either early or late. There's no such thing as on time in our business. Um, We, because of the expectation management, because we coordinate travel and experience and events, we have to operate like a finely tuned Swiss watch, you know, just precision. And, uh, And we have to be ahead of schedule. And we have to beat budgets and we have to, you know, so it's not like a, an on time game. It's an excellence game. And, and I also have discovered that you can scale services, um, but they scale differently than traditional technology businesses. Uh, you've heard Peter Thiel talk about a secret, Mm -hmm. right? That, that a founder 
can understand a market uniquely in a way that others don't. And that information can build a very powerful business because of that unique understanding. Well, some unique learnings are at work in the heart of Myria. While I can't share them all, I'm, you know, I'm happy to share a couple of them and kind of talk through those if people are, are thinking about, you know, ideas that you can kind of exploit and, and take them down the line. Well, just just the way of delivering your service, right, is is a message to anybody that wants to be successful. The baseline isn't good enough, right? Just doing the job and going home isn't good enough, right? Showing up early, leaving late, <laughs> right? Doing an exceptional job, that's what's putting you on the map because you're dealing with people that did something right, <laughs> right? People don't, pe w w inheritance aside, right? People that go, you interact with, they figured something out. They did something right. And if they expect things to run in a certain way, and you wanna be one of these people one day, yep. well then perhaps you should be behaving and over delivering right. and keeping your promises and showing up early and busting your ass because that, that's the only way that you'll end up in a position to even be able to judge that performance of others. Yeah. And, you know, this last lesson. So on March 13th, I believe, 2020, uh, at the start of lockdowns in America, it was kind of the first day that San Francisco locked down, uh, Jeff Bezos was worth $113 billion. Bezos's quote about Amazon is his most famous had always been your fat margins are my opportunity. Mm. Um, on that same day, Bernard Arnault, the founder and chairman of LVMH, uh, had a net worth of about $76 billion that day. <laughs> the world shuts down. Uh, Arnault had a quote that said, luxury products are the only way to make a luxury margin. So who was right? Bezos or Arno, is it, you know, fat margins are the opportunity mm -hmm. to take your customer or is it luxury margins are the way to build a very profitable business? Well, when the world shut down, all the smart money on Wall Street said Amazon's going to be the beneficiary. Mm -hmm. Stores are closing, restaurants are closing, people are going to need their stuff brought to them via truck, via Amazon. Amazon's stock price went up. Ripped. Yeah. Okay. But those closures quickly disrupted supply chains, made warehouse workers call in sick, et cetera, et cetera. It closed Bernard Arnault's stores as well. But in Amazon, all of the products that Amazon sells are subject to the law of demand. And so the minute the supply chain got disrupted and prices increased, demand dropped. So less than a year from that happening, October, Bernard Arnault had surpassed Jeff Bezos as the richest man in the world. And it was fascinating because LVMH's stores, many of them were closed. But Bernard Arnault's products aren't subject to the law of demand. Many of them are not. They are Veblen goods. These are products for which if you raise the price, the demand goes up, not down. And for anyone out there wanting to build a business in the ultra high net worth space, if your product is actually a Veblen product, it's not, nobody's going to buy it. But if you have the first, the best, the only, some unique offering about wit that people are really and truly passionate about, um, the price is completely flexible. And so if you build a business there, you can scale differently. So you know what scale looks like in a traditional startup. You got a, an, an You've got an X axis on the horizon. You've got a Y axis going vertical mm -hmm. and the X is customers and the Y is money. Yep. Right. And so you see the little scale chart, like I'm growing customers mm -hmm. and you're trying to grow those, you know, those customers and you're trying to keep expenses down and revenue up so that at some point they're, you know, the curve kinks and it just goes curve, to the moon. Right. Yeah. Cool. Um, but you need more customers. So we think of scale as customers, 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 a million, two million at internet scale, consumer product scale, yeah. because that's the only way, because you can't raise prices, right? So you're trying to sell more units at whatever your margin is, because you mm -hmm. raise prices, it, it messes it up. Anyway, um, when you sell Veblen goods, you're actually able to scale the Y axis. 
this is one of the secrets. So you can scale ultimately with a static customer base or, or slowly growing when, customer when, base. When, when, exactly. When your customers are the richest people in the world and the products you're selling them are incredibly in demand. Right. Um, those businesses can scale differently. And this was the lesson that Bernard Arnault kind of showed the world in the public markets. And this principle is one that, um, you know, that we work through and to, to kind of take forward in our business. Dude, this was great to have you on, man. It's always good to be back. I really appreciate you coming Nick out Crown, here. Thank you for to having Chicago. me. Thank you for having and me. And dude, I hope you come back soon. Can't wait.